Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green. You are a physician on the Big Island and State Senator also from Kailua Kona. Thanks for joining me. We've had a really vibrant discussion over these many months and we're now entering our second year on the program, so I'm so pleased to be here with you. Today I'm really lucky to have an expert on healthcare and public health. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the difference between public health and health care, and we're going to get into that today. So today my guest is Dr. Jay Maddock, who's a PhD, did his undergraduate work at Syracuse and then did a PhD at Rhode Island, came here in 1999 to be one of our experts in public health. He did a fellowship at that point, I should say a postdoc, and has ever since been our leader in public health here in Hawaii. I've worked with Jay on many projects and been very impressed by both his intelligence and his compassion towards the people of Hawaii. So today we're going to hear from him on the, the prevalent problems we face in Hawaii, the things that we can do about it going forward, and also to give us a historical perspective on public health in our state. So first I want to introduce you to Jay. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here. Uh, I wanted to mention that he's the professor and director at the Public Health Studies, uh, the public health studies at UH. He's chair of the State Board of Health. You've authored 85 plus scientific articles, so you're a leader in your field. Tell us what brought you to Hawaii, Jay. Sure, you know, I, I finished up my PhD uh, at the University of Rhode Island and really had this exciting opportunity to come out and uh, work at the Cancer Research Center, which is, uh, you know, one of the shining jewels in here uh, in the state and, and nationwide. Right. And uh, it was an exciting time to really learn a lot about the cutting edge cancer research, a lot of the work in the different ethnic groups and how different ethnic groups in Hawaii get different types of cancer, which is a fascinating thing from a research piece, but also really important to the people here in Hawaii. So right. that's how I started my career. And then I was able to move over to the public health program um, in 2000 and been there since. Fantastic. Now, why don't we start people from the beginning? What is a public health program and what is it in Hawaii? Sure. Um, first, just public health. I mean, a lot of people don't understand what public health is. Right. And um, you might see it when you come to the airport and you'll see the sign for public health. And those are the people that do quarantine, right? And so that's an aspect of public health. If somebody comes and they're sick on an airplane, um, we, we look out for them. But what you can think about public health is, is it's everything that's not clinical in keeping people healthy. So when we think of health, when we think of health care, we tend to think of physicians and nurses and people that you go to when you're sick. Right. We don't think of when we turn on the tap that we get a clean glass of water. That's public health. We don't tend to think of um, who tells us what type of food we should be eating, what's healthy versus not healthy food. Um, policies and laws around wearing a seat belt or not smoking in a certain area. That's all public health. So it's everything that combines to keep us healthy outside of the clinical setting. So it's become a very dynamic um, discipline here and I think you've been a part of that. Am I correct that a new program has just begun here in, in our state? Yeah, you know, um, traditionally we've done all of our training at the graduate level. So we get people in from all different fields and our major degree is uh, the Master's in Public Health at MPH, mm -hmm. um, where the majority of our students have been. We also offer uh, PhDs in epidemiology and a doctorate in public health. What we found in the last few years is that we really need to start training students earlier. And so just this past year, in January, uh, we opened up the bachelor's degree in public health, which we're really excited about. It really provides a, a great hands-on training and lets the students coming through the University of Hawaii have a very tangible degree with real skills that they can learn. And it's also perfect for students that are thinking about pre-med, pre-nursing, pre-pharmacy. Um, you know, if they're thinking professional track, they can do this as an undergrad and get great training and then go right into the professional field. Well, I have to tell you, I'm actually hearing a buzz about it, and I don't work at the university, so for me to hear a buzz about a program that people are going to be flocking to, I think, is something. And I'm guessing you're going to have a lot of people applying to be a part of the program. What's your capacity going to be over at, at Manoa? You know, it's very interesting. We've looked, um, you know, at some of the mainland places, some of our, our peers in California. So we've noticed that the UC Berkeley now has 400 majors in public health, and UC Irvine has 1,000. They're only five years old, have 1,000 majors. Uh, we're hoping to ramp up to 400 um, students within five years. So we have 70 uh, students in our uh, introductory class this semester. So we might be closer to that 1,000. Uh, you know, we'll, so we're going to do our best to try to keep up with the capacity. It's exciting. You know, on, on this program, we've talked about many, many facets of our healthcare system. And I remind people that uh, in Hawaii, $9 billion is spent in the economy of health care every year, which is a gigantic number when you compare it to other pieces of our economy. And the Department of Health, when I had um, the director on, 
she was able to reflect on the size of the Department of Health. I mean, it's 5,000 employees plus in the Department of Health. It's one of our biggest departments. But I think that they're always working hard to find new blood and, and new young professionals. So is this something that will happen? Will you become a feeder for programs like Department of Health? Where will people work? Yeah, I think that that's exactly. We, we're training people with really good skills um, for the Department of Health, but also for a lot of our community nonprofits. And if you go around, you'll notice it's, it's surprising how many people you find in leadership roles with an MPH. And so, um, you know, our former director of health was an alumnus of our program. We see, um, you know, American Heart Association, American Cancer, a lot of people that are MPH trained. And it's such a great, versatile degree that you learn things like evaluation and needs assessment program planning that really can be used in any field. And it gives you the business skills also to manage and run organizations. So how will it work? Do you think you'll see um, young people get into the bachelor's degree and then will they be inclined often to go on to masters and PhDs or do you think that a lot of them will peel off into medical school and other programs like that? What's your best guess? Yeah, we really think that people are going to go all sorts of places. So um, definitely uh, at the baccalaureate level, I think it's probably one of the most uh, applied degrees that people are going to be able to get jobs when they graduate. I got my bachelor's in psychology and uh, there are not a lot of jobs for bachelor's in psychology, unfortunately. Um, I think public health will be different, but we know a lot are going to go into different careers. And then what we're seeing now which, with our younger generation and what we're really focusing on is global health. We realize how interconnected the world is, how interconnected diseases are, and health. And so students really want that international experience. And so we've been able to bring that here to Hawaii with a lot of our programs and a um, you know, vigorous exchange program with China that lets a lot of our students study and do work in China before they graduate. That's cool. Now, didn't you tell me you're heading off to China in a couple weeks? Yeah, I'm heading off uh, right after graduation. And you know we have this fantastic exchange program at three universities there that both students and faculty exchange. And we have joint research projects looking at really important public health issues like air quality. We know that air quality is a major problem in China. And a lot of that pollution is now showing up in Hawaii and in on the mainland. 10% of California's pollution is from China. That's incredible. Well, I'll tell you, I would tell my children to go into public health, except they're only seven and three years old, respectively, right now. So we'll get them soon. <laughs> they want to be firemen and ballerinas at the yes. moment. But <laughs> when the time comes, it's going to be a degree I recommend to them very highly. So OK, so we've established what public health is. Uh, why don't you give me a little bit of perspective as we're, we're about halfway through our first segment here. What have been some of the historical uh, big public health issues that have um, that have been on people's minds in Hawaii and, and, and give us that historical perspective for you coming here many years ago. Sure. So if you look at, at um, you know, historically, um, public health is mostly about infectious disease, right? So we can think about polio, um, tuberculosis, diseases that were killing a lot of people. And um, we teach about uh, the cholera epidemic in, in um, in London, where Jon Snow took the handle off the pump, and that was, you know, instead of all the tr you know, treatments and physicians couldn't figure it out, he took the pump handle off so they couldn't get the water, cholera went away. And so that was, you know, from uh, early 1900s through about mid century, mm -hmm. um, that was the major issue. And then we got really good with antibiotics and, and other treatments, and infectious disease really dropped. And we've seen actually the greatest increase in lifespan was due to public health um, of about 15 years in the, in the 1900s. Yes. Then it really moved to chronic disease. So we, um, you know, the prevalence of smoking in the 1950s was 40 percent. Right. And wow. yeah, crazy. And then the Surgeon General's report came out, and a lot of the public health efforts, you know, no smoking sections in restaurants, that turned into smoking bans like we have here in Hawaii. Um, I was fortunate enough to chair the Coalition for Tobacco Free Hawaii when we banned smoking in bars and restaurants. Awesome. And you know, major effects like that. So smoking now in Hawaii has really, really dropped, and the health effects um, have dropped dramatically. Also, what we're seeing, unfortunately, at the same time is obesity is rising. So right. physical inactivity, poor nutrition is leading to an increase in obesity. So that seems to be taking over um, from smoking as the leading cause of death in the state. So what you're saying is that um, your predecessors in, you know, earlier in the century, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they were working on issues like smoking um, and major pollutants and so on and were able to elucidate how that was killing society or decreasing lifespan and so on. But there's been now a change, a total changeover into now these chronic diseases like diabetes, blood pressure, you know, obesity. So what are we doing? What are we doing here in Hawaii on some of these issues? Sure. Um, part of what we realize, and um, you know, it, it's great to talk to a senator, is that so much of this stuff happens from policy and environmental change. You know, if you think about somebody in the 1950s, the lifestyle was very active, right? right? You, you were active, even though you might not be eating the healthiest for anybody to watch this Mad Men, you know, with a lot of yeah. steak and potatoes. Right. Um, the portions were smaller. Um, and so we've seen increases in portion size. We've seen um, a lifestyle where we're, we're told to sit all the time, where we don't mm. 
Um, we, you know, we drive to work, we sit all day, we drive home. And so we're doing a lot to try to shift the environment. So how do you do that? Well, um, you can do that through uh, worksite wellness programs, through encouraging people to take the stairs, through incentivizing things like the bus or um, walking and biking. Uh, we've been working with city and county to look at bike share yes. uh, in Honolulu to get people biking more often. Um, we've worked on policy called Complete Streets, which um, anytime there's a new build on a street in any county in Hawaii now, they have to consider pedestrians and cyclists as well as the cars. And so that's a major shift in the way we build our roads. Because we all know anybody that's biked around here is there's a lot of places it's not the safest place in the world to bike, right, sure. and that's an important change because that's a barrier then to people being active. So that's a lot of the policy. We've been looking at some on the food side um, around sugar-sweetened beverages. We know that sodas, uh, you know, fruit-type juices um, are, are really dangerous because they don't have any nutrition value, and it's easy to drink a lot of them. You know, it, you can only have so many steaks, yeah. but you can put down a 64-ounce soda, you right. know, which is, is a different thing. And so looking at the possibility of taxing sugar-sweetened beverages, it seems to be in the economic models that it would have a, you know, a fairly sizable effect on consumption, especially in children. We know when we tax cigarettes, we see a big drop in youth consumption because right. kids have such a fixed income. Right. Yeah, so it's just it's interesting. You, you bring up so many different subjects. I don't even almost know where to, yeah. to start. But one thing that you said um, when you talked about, say, the Complete Streets initiatives, that suggests that a public health um, expert like yourself you're not just sitting at the university, you're engaging development. Is that the case? So I, I've heard stories now that in some of the development communities, they're now reaching out to public health experts like you to say, what can we actually do to be a part of the solution instead of just a negative in some people's mind, oh, that's just another big tower. Mm -hmm. You're now saying, if we build smart communities, people will walk, they'll be less obese, they will decrease their uh, risk of hypertension, all those things. So do people come to you to consult? How does that go? Yeah, we spend a lot of time working in the community. It's, it's a really exciting field because so much of it is interdisciplinary. We have to work across architecture and urban planning um, with the private community, looking at a lot of these things and, and how they work together. And um, you know, really being active, it's, it's so much fun of it is, is getting out and trying to work in the community to make real changes happen. So now, are you posted fully at the university or are you also posted at Department of Health? How does that work? Sure, my um, appointment is fully with the university but I have a contract with the State Department of Health that's gone back to 2000 where we've had a partnership where we work on a lot of the uh, research and evaluation of something called the Healthy Hawaii Initiative, which is a program to increase physical activity, improve nutrition, reduce tobacco use in the state. Wow. What's, what's been some of the greatest successes? We have a couple min more minutes before our first break. Um, going back over the last 20 years for Hawaii, where would you say we've been successful in a public health uh, discussion? Sure. I think we've been, um, we've been very successful in reducing tobacco use. We have one of the lowest uh, use rates in the nation. And a lot of that is this policy environment, right? So it's, I mentioned the banning, yes. smoking in indoor areas. Also, the taxes are very, very high. Yes. Um, we've done a really good job. Actually, some of the projects I've worked on in the past is the enforcement of sales to minors. So we have less, I think it's about a 7% rate of uh, illegal sales to minors, which is very, very low. It was 44% when we started. Wow. Um, so keeping hands out of it, cigarettes out of the hands of kids. Um, we've done a really good job in controlling HIV, right? HIV rates are, are very low in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the infection, uh, infectious disease transmission is, is good. Um, we have the longest lifespan in the country, you know, so we actually do really well. We've been rated the healthiest state in the nation, so we, we do well in most areas. Right. Uh, yeah, that's so interesting to me. So on those, on those um, topics, uh, smoking, it's been keeping cigarettes out of kids' hands so they don't start early. You said taxes banning in restaurants and so on. What's the next thing on smoking? Is it an all-out ban? Is it uh, continuing that process of increasing cost and decreasing the comfort level of people smoking in public? What, what's your solution? You know, it's an interesting thing. I think, you know, a lot of, we've done pretty much uh, what every, you know, the best states have done. You know, we're, we're ahead of the curve. And so I think that we're trying to experiment with stuff now. So, um, you know, the county council banned smoking on beaches this right. this year and then on the big island they raised the smoking rate to 20 28 21 for the age yes and so you know good evaluation of those we're doing really good evaluation of the beach stuff look actually doing observational about how many people are smoking on the beaches um, we can look and see what's effective and what's not so really it's it ended up being the cutting edge policy research right now to see where things are at um, we know that e-cigarettes is a question and it's very it's interesting it's a controversial area in public health because uh, on one side we really don't want to see uptake we don't want 
want to see new smokers smoking e-cigarettes. But on the other side, it seems like it could be, if done right, a potential way to get lifelong smokers off of cigarettes in a harm reduction model. So that's one of the big research questions. And you know, it's, when you're at the university, it's not as black and white as people often are in the advocacy field. Well, I'm going to um, I'm going to rely on you because next year, if people have me back at the legislature, um, I, that is a really compelling question. And I think that the nice thing about what you do in your discipline is you can give us the science behind it. You can give us the actual numbers. It, and you and I have had many conversations before, and I've always respected the fact that it's not judgmental from you. It's analytical. And if it's an analytical approach that helps people's health, then we go yep. with it. If it's just a judgmental or it's just hearsay, then we shouldn't. And I think that bringing that kind of analytical approach to these policy questions makes a world of difference. So why don't we stop there? Okay. Uh, we'll take a brief break. I'm Josh Green, your host of Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm joined today by Professor Jay Maddock, who is an expert in public health. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And urban transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in a diverse body of, of guests both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green from the Big Island. The Senate session has ended. Everyone is safe. And now I've got an expert uh, guest today on our show, Dr. Jay Maddock, who's PhD over at uh, Manoa who brings a wealth of information on public health matters. So welcome, Jay. Thank you. So when we left off just a few minutes ago, we were talking about uh, smoking and the successes that Hawaii has had over the past uh, generation, the mm -hmm. last 20 years, decreasing the rate of smoking. And now we have emerging questions. You were uh, mentioning e-cigarettes and how that's going to be a, an interesting challenge. And I know the federal government's also looking at it. What are some of the other emerging uh, public health uh, issues that you see as relevant right now, right here in Hawaii? Sure. I think one of the biggest things that we're all worried about is climate change. Um, you know, as the, the climate changes, it's going to affect a lot of things that affect public health. And so um, you might say, oh, you know, what does, you know, a degree or two difference make? And I think, you know, it's, it's hard to really understand what that means. Well, one of the major ones we see is, is sea level rise. And you'll see out in the Pacific, um, countries like Tuvalu, Mm -hmm. are seeing the water actually rise up and islands become uninhabitable. Um, and you know, of course, we all live on an island and we know that one meter sea level rise could wipe out Waikiki, wow. right? So that's a big change. But what happens also besides that, that's kind of the one that we see uh, dramatized all the time, yes. is coral reef bleaching, right? We're seeing ocean acidification mm -hmm. and it can ruin the coral reef. Now the coral reef is extremely important to the health of everybody here, right? It protects against tsunamis. They have all of our reef fish there. Um, you know, that are part of the, the eco chain and the system of all the larger fish that we eat, right? right. And so the food system is, is in peril too with coral reef bleaching. Interesting. So, so a lot of times, I guess people would have said uh, those are environmental policy right. questions, but you bring them up as an expert in health policy. Yeah. And does that, is that because it quickly gets to uh, foodstuffs and what we eat? Or is it just because it's going to affect us in many, many ways? Nutritional questions. Uh, unpack that for me a little bit. I think you can't um, separate environmental issues from human health. I mean, it's such a, a related thing together. We are as healthy as the, the place that we live. And I think one of the reasons we have the longest lifespan in the world is we live in one of the best environmentally endowed places in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and as that changes, it's going to directly affect um, the health of people here. And um, the other thing that you know is important with climate change is as we see temperatures rise, um, we become more and more into this tropical zone. And so there's infectious disease that we've lucky that we don't see a lot, right? We don't see a lot of dengue fever, but we could definitely see more of that. Um, we haven't had malaria here, but you know this could become a malaria zone. You look at a lot of other tropical areas, you know, these, these things happen. Yes. Um, we can see, you know, additional um, 
invasive species coming in, a lot of things that affect the way of life um, in Hawaii um, through climate change. And then, of course, there's the storm effect, right? We know that storms become more intense, and so we've been lucky that we haven't had a strong hurricane since Aniki. Right. But we, we all know that's only a matter of time. And as we're seeing in the, in the Atlantic region, you know, with more and more really powerful storms coming through, um, we can see more here. And, you know, one thing I, I tell everybody in, in my classes is we look at Katrina yes. and we look at New Orleans, which is contiguous to the rest of the United States, and how hard it was to get those people out of New Orleans, which is a major public health issue, right? Um, we can also look at what happened um, with, uh, you know, cholera coming up in, in places um, like in Haiti, right? After, after they had the big storm, cholera showed up. Right. Like, think of Hawaii. Now, we're, we're 2,500 miles from Los Angeles. We're really at risk for a lot of these major public health issues if we ever did have a major storm that was disabling to um, food, water, energy reaching our island. Fascinating. In fact, I, I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me to, to bring this up until just now, but didn't you sit with... Um, former Vice President Al Gore recently and have a discussion. What, what was that like? What did you talk about? Yeah, it was very interesting. You know, um, you know, Senator Gore has really been the leader on this. He's one that, you know, that sounded the, the alarm bell with the inconvenient truth. And, right. and really, he realizes Hawaii as, you know, kind of the canary in the coal mine, I think, for, at least for the U.S., mm -hmm. is that we are more vulnerable than, um, you know, any other state in the U.S. We have this, you know, we have a tropical climate, we are separated, mm -hmm. um, we import so much of our energy that really, um, you know, when things change, as they're changing, um, we really need to look at mitigation. You know, it's um, our carbon emissions, you know, are, are minor compared to China's and the, and the mainland U.S., but right. our risk is most of the Pacific, so we're at high risk but yet low emitters. Um, which, which puts us really in a, in a terrible spot. So we need to kind of raise our voices to make sure that China, India, L.A., New York, they begin to what? What, what do they have to do? What do they have to really um, rein in carbon emissions? What's, what, what's the prevailing wisdom right now? Sure. Um, you know, we're really looking at, at the need um, very soon for a major change in carbon emissions. I mean, reductions of 20%. I um, mean, you know, this, this is... It's becoming a, a major, major crisis, and it's interesting if you look at, um, you know, Sputnik back in the space race. You know, right. uh, we looked and we looked at the Soviet Union, and we said we have to do something now. Yes. We're going to put all of our resources into the U.S. catching up and surpassing the Soviet Union in the space race. Right. We haven't seen that kind of urgency for climate change, even though you know the effect certainly on human health is and, and just human society is much, much more important than the space race. We haven't had any sense of urgency um, and multinational. And I think a lot of the developing countries especially are looking at, you guys had your development. We yeah. know what London looked like through the Industrial Revolution with the pollution and everything. Right. You know, why shouldn't we be able to do the same thing? And I, you know, I go to China a lot and that's part of the argument is we want to have our time to industrialize and this is how the U.S. did it, this is how the British did it, why can't we do it that way? Right, and I, and I understand that uh, towers just sprout up in China and, and major major industries going on everywhere you look. I haven't been to China in now more than a decade, but I think, I mean, I, I think that it's borne out that way. Uh, tell me this, um, you know, as far as energy, see, I, I kind of agree with you. I think that uh, as, um, as President Obama was coming into office, I was hoping that um, the key initiative, of course, I was gratified that he took health care on as a physician and a, and a legislator that focuses on health care. That was really neat to see. Um, and I think some of it's been very good and some of it's been, you know, challenging and right. questionable. But, you know, you're always going to get the good with the bad. But the, uh, the energy issue, had we taken it up, it seems to me that not only would we be ch taking on the challenges that you bring up mm -hmm. as far as these major health uh, impacts of global warming, but also having some kind of sustainable energy plan that brings down costs and use of fossil fuels would have kept us out of perhaps some conflicts, would have uh, mitigated our need to be engaged in the Middle East in the way we have been. Um, is that what you're hearing in the in the dialogue, or am I? Is that a reach? Right. No, I think I think you're you're totally on it. And it's, it's interesting. I think bring it home here to Hawaii. I mean, certainly there's national energy policy, right. but I think this is an opportunity for us to really make a difference. I think we've, you know, we've relied so much on tourism yes. as the major industry. And I think sustainable energy and the development and being on the cutting edge of sustainable energy makes so much sense for us. We, we import so much oil to Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're so vulnerable to you know, stops in the supply chain yes. or to price changes. We know how much gas costs all of us right now. 
Um, and if we really looked at it, we are endowed with so much natural resources. We have the solar power, we have the wind, we have the waves, we have the geothermal. Right. Um, we've got every natural resource that you could want to generate power, yeah. and yet we haven't really made this major shift. And if you brought the you know the the best people here, the, you know the scientists here to develop this kind of stuff, the companies to develop this stuff, that could become our industry. You know, we could become the place known in the world for alternate energy, and really it would help sustain our economy. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I you know my understanding uh, from being from sitting on the energy committee over the years has been that um, we import in excess of four billion dollars worth of oil every year to uh, to run our cars and you know, machines and so on, and it's very expensive. It comes from a lot of different places, including Singapore and others, and uh, we are so dependent. If we had a, a disruption in our in our energy chain, our our petrol chain, we'd be in deep trouble really quickly. Um, and I know that, and people in my community suffer very badly at at the expense of high costs, the high kilowatt hour costs on Big Island. And, and frankly, it's a in some ways, it's a very high tax. It's a regressive tax because people need energy. Uh, I got patients who, you know, they. They have children that need to use um, asthma machines, you know, nebulizer machines, and when the power goes out, they're in big trouble. Um, so there's so many issues out there. Uh, now, you though are engaging as a public health professional on an energy issue. I, you told me a little bit briefly. Uh, maybe I hope it's not um, letting the cat out of the bag. People are asking for your advice on whether or not geothermal is a um, a safe. Uh, road to go forward on. I, I don't want to put you on the spot as to what you think is right or wrong, but when someone asks a public health uh, uh, doctorate to weigh in, how does that go? Sure. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So, um, you know, geothermal is definitely a, a way that we can bring in uh, clean alternate energy, and it's right. something that is fairly consistent in the amount of um, energy, but we know that there's, any, like any power plant, there's going to be some sort of yes. uh, release of chemicals, right? And right. so um, there's been concerns in the Puna community over, over on Big Island mm -hmm. um, about some of the health effects. And so, um, you know, I have been talking to the mayor's office there and how we do this right. And the thing about public health is that everything we do is based on science. And so Good. I've been helping them say, how do we do this so that we look at the health effects, we measure it well. I don't have a stake either way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the important thing is we have to be um, you know, even though we, we care so much about public health, I don't know the answer to this one without doing the good research. So we go in and try to do things fair. How do we do a study that we, we have, you know, both sides agree on the methodology, how you're going to do it ahead of time. You do the research and you look at what the data says. I mean, that's kind of what I mentioned with e-cigarettes, you know. Yeah. I don't know. And the science is so new, the science isn't there yet. And sometimes that's frustrating to people. You know, you go in, yeah. into the community or into the legislature yeah. and sometimes people want me to be the big advocate. Yeah. And I say, I can, I can tell you what the data says. And that's as far as I can go. And, 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 um, but I, and I might change my mind. You know, mm -hmm. new studies come out. You know, we have to change. We can't stick to the same dog. But if you look at uh, diet and nutrition, you know, it's one thing that back in the 90s, right, everybody was uh, staying away from uh, fat, right? right? That became the big thing. And the studies were showing that if you ate a lot of fat in your diet, you know, you're more likely to be obese. And, and then we got better science. Right. And when we look at it now, it seems that sugar is probably a worse culprit than, than um then fat and, and diet is such a complex thing. It's one of the hardest ones because we eat in a, in a natural living environment. We eat all sorts of foods. It's hard to measure. Right. Um, and then people say, well, you're always changing the recommendations. And what we're doing is we're just relying on the latest science. You know, if we, if we never change our recommendations, we wouldn't be keeping up to date with what we know, what's the best practice from, from the science. Well, I'm, I'm pleased, though, that they are engaging you. I think that that shows a lot of wisdom on the part of the mayor of Big Island and his team. I think that it also, uh, it's comforting to me to, that you can take it uh, in its own context, in the context of good public health, so that we can be respectful of the host culture, we can be respectful of the people who live near a plant, we can be respectful of, of the entire Big Island community, but at the same time we can do a full scientific assessment so that you can give the data to people and then let them debate that data rather than um, point fingers at each other and say yes, no, you're my enemy on this issue, I'm not going to work with you. And if we begin to take that approach on public health matters, I think we're going to do very well. Mm -hmm. Another thing is uh, the fact that they've gotten someone who appears to be very neutral on the matter uh, is good because in my uh, world, I get a lot of people coming in who own a power plant and mm -hmm. they want to put it up. Or I, I get someone um, on the other side of an issue who feels very strongly that um, they're advocating for their 
you know, and it's fair for their, um, you know, their salary or their, uh, you know, their bottom line, their profit. And that makes it very difficult to make a good judgment. Whereas if we can bring science to public health and we can bring science to public policy and even science to the process of government debate, I think that we just might get out of this, this whole grand uh, experiment in democracy in a better way. So why don't we take our next break, okay. and then when we come back, I'm going to ask you what you think the next five years are going to look like in public health. Sure. All right. This is Josh Green, uh, your host of Healthcare in Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week, I'm right here at Think Tank Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Boards as Bio Briefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim. We see if they catch anybody. We check out the latest biosimilars, you know, the kind that, uh, what was his name, the guy with the bicycle? Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here, Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii. Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island ER Physician. Today I'm joined uh, in a vibrant discussion about public health in Hawaii with Dr. Jay Maddock who's a professor at the university and runs the program there, has recently started an undergraduate degree in public health, which I think is going to be very, very enticing for many of our students. We've begun to discuss the full scope of public health, and Jay was able to talk to us about the old day when the major debate was about tobacco and how it moved to chronic disease and diabetes. We've had changes in science, and the dialogue about nutrition has um, evolved from fats in the diet to sugars in the diet and so many other interesting uh, issues, such as climate change and how that's going to affect us in Hawaii. But now I wanted to ask Jay, what's the next five to ten years look like in public health? So. Give us kind of the crystal ball version of what you think you'll be working on these coming years. Sure. You know, it's, uh, I think I'm biased in a way that I do a lot of work in China. I actually have faculty appointments at two Chinese universities. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, there's an old saying that says, um, why do you rob a bank? And they said, it's because that's where the money is. Well, why do you work public health in China? Because that's where the people are. Yes. Right? And so I think we look at a lot of the where Hawaii is and how we are so... Um, uh, dependent on tourism and how there are planes that come from all over the world mm -hmm. all the time right. and we look at what's what's coming out of, out of China so we've seen um, you know several instances now of avian influenza right and the idea is that you know these really um, scary flu viruses right, right can jump from bird trans bird to human transmission to human to human transmission right that we'd have no um, vaccine for and no natural resistance to and you can see somebody gets on a plane in um, Beijing, they're here and eight hours later and that entire plane is infected and you know the entire island is infected very quickly. Right. And so I think that's a major issue is, is the transmission of new emerging infectious disease. Uh, we're seeing that MERS right now in the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome, right? There was an article today about that. Yeah. Yes. And that's the kind of stuff, it's, we never, and you never know which one is going to be the one that really comes, I mean the, the um, H1N1 that came out of Mexico a few years mm -hmm. ago, we're lucky. Right, and yeah. so it's, it, it's, it always depends on how the virus shifts, what's going to happen, and so it, it's always constant vigilance on a lot of these things because there's going to be the one. We had the 1918 pandemic influenza that was a huge cause of death throughout the United States and throughout the world. Yes. Um, you know, if we ever had that again, it's really, really bad. And what's scary is the people that are most affected are people like you and I. It's 30 to 40 year olds who are in the workforce because of the social mingle and everything, but you lose your entire economic development because everybody working is the one that gets sick. Wow. Um, where normal influenza tends to be infants and elderly. And so it's a very interesting kind of shift. Um, the other thing I see is, um, you know, we've, no, we've, we've outsourced our manufacturing to China, right? right. And so um, if you go there, you see massive, massive um, factories and plants, and you can see the air. You know, and, you know, one thing in public health is if you can see the air, you know there's a problem, right? And people are wearing masks everywhere, and we're seeing air quality index off the charts. You know, we thought that 500 was the top, and Beijing had a 755 day, 
way off the chart, the particulate matter that you, you can see. And so what's happening that is, um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues in Japan. Japan is extremely worried. They're seeing pollution. Um, Korea is seeing pollution. 10% mm -hmm. of California's pollution, air pollution, is from China. What about us here? Do we get any um, direct pollution from China yet? We're not getting as much. And part of it is the patterns of um, of the air that go across. Um, but we also don't have great monitoring um, you know, to, to see how much is coming from China. You know, we, we actually, surprisingly, we got um, skipped by a lot of the debris from the, the uh, tsunami in Japan. You know, the, the nuclear waste and radiation yes. hit California, didn't hit us. So a lot of it does depend on the patterns. Yes. But um, will we see it? We could. And we know that our environment is what makes tourism so attractive. Right. If our environment's hurt, we, don't, we lose our economy. So a lot of health and economic things are linked together. Yeah, I try to explain that to people when they wonder why uh, we need to fight so hard to keep our, our tourism impeccable. I do explain that um, tourism and whatever other industries we do have, ag has been pretty good to us recently, and I think health, our health economy has been growing very significantly. But if we don't have those resources, we can't fund the schools, or we can't fund the hospital uh, that we want to replace, or we can't fund the roads, you know. So um, everything is inter intertwined, and uh, we can't fund the um, salaries for a nursing team or or any number of services. So it's all it is all uh, commingled, if you will. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, and I think my viewers would be upset with me if I didn't. Could you give us a little bit of um, what your experience was from the public health? Uh, uh, perspective on uh, Fukushima and the reactor. Uh, did we suffer, uh, to our knowledge, any ill effects? Was there any radiation? People have asked me repeatedly, um, were the fish affected? W what have you been hearing? From what I've heard, we haven't. Um, there have been fish coming up on the west coast that seem to have uh, radiation effects. Um, we've not seen any, and a lot of it is, it's the, it's the water patterns and it's the migration patterns that okay. we're not getting a lot of fish that come from Japan to Hawaii. Um, so we've been, we've been lucky. I mean, we really were lucky in this. I think, you know, again, as we talked about energy, um, you know, it puts nuclear in the mix. And, and I think we have to look at, at, and every energy has both the positive and a negative side to it. And, and this one, you know, major, major um, negative side to that. Right. Um, and knowing that there's communities where people will never go back to their houses is, is probably the worst consequence you can have from energy. Right, yeah, and there's, there's the, the loss of a whole region, and then there's, of course, the leukemias and the lymphomas and whatnot. And we know we saw that in Chernobyl. And so uh, Hawaii has always been cautious in yeah. this area. And I think that speaks to why people are right now consulting with you as an expert on geothermal. and. Is it safe to do the next level of plants? Uh, my understanding was that I think it's Iceland has done a lot of uh, advanced work, and yes. the idea, I suppose, would be if we do it, we should do it right here. Yes. We should do the right technologies and, mm -hmm. and appreciate all the benefits, but also uh, limit the potential downside. Yeah. Tell me, let me ask you a few rapid-fire questions about different public health questions um, that we've got. Tell me about VOG. What, what, what is the discussion been about VOG and Big Island air quality and how it moves over here. Has there been much research on it? You know, there, there's been a lot of research coming out of the uh, medical school yes. uh, looking at the health effects of VOG. It certainly is um, a contaminant. It certainly um, it seems to exacerbate people's asthma. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's tough because it's a natural, um, right. you know, contaminant. And so I think really the best stuff is to have the warnings, um, really to look at people that have uh, compromised respiratory systems to, mm -hmm. to take precautions on those days right. and really try to limit it. I mean, that's a really difficult one because there's not much we can do to mitigate. Yeah, I had, you know, I had some constituents who were very worried about that and we did what we could to give them extra insurance coverage, uh, especially people who had asthma. We asked people to not smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, if they were smokers, we yep. tried to give them extra support so that they didn't have two right. um, irritants against their lungs. But then I had some constituents who asked me, why don't we uh, nuke the volcano? You know, and <laughs> I said, well, that's probably not going to be in our public health interest, you know. So, <laughs> the, you know, you really do get a lot of different interesting uh, conversation uh, points. But um, we're dealing with it, and it's an interesting public policy question. Uh, you talked about walkable streets, mm -hmm. um, livable communities and, and communities that we can walk in. How realistic is that in your uh, estimation uh, with the development community? Do they, are they open to spending extra resources to make public health a priority? Yeah, you know what, it's interesting. Um, and I think that's, if we frame it that way, yes, I think we're dead. Okay. Um, if we frame it in the way that people really like living in walkable communities and the units actually tend to sell for more money oh, when they're in what people like it. It's, it's a facet, especially in the younger generations. Yes. And so good 
walkable design is actually desirable design. If there is a, a walking or biking path in your community, you're going to see houses sell for more money. Now, we do worry about gentrification that people can't afford. We know how expensive it is to live in Hawaii. Right. And so we want this for everybody. But it's an easy sell for developers because once they see it and they see the numbers, they say, wow, I can actually do better with my project if I do this. Interesting. So yeah. fascinating. And let me ask you again about, uh, you touched on it already, but uh, a virus. Is that the biggest threat that we have in the state of Hawaii in the immediate short term? Is that, is that the thing that keeps you awake at night? You know, a lot of things keep me awake. <laughs> I think that's one of the issues with public health. There's so many. Um, one thing I haven't touched on that I think is, is becoming the most emerging problem, and, and maybe not as much in Hawaii as we're seeing in the mainland and other areas, is water. Right? Access to clean water is becoming such a major problem. And we're seeing this in California. Um, we're certainly seeing it in the Middle East. Um, you know, the, the future wars are going to be fought over water, not over oil, um, because populations can't live without water, right? And so um, a lot of it's getting contaminated. It's not that we always have the same amount of water, right? Yes. But it's access to clean, fresh water in places where populations are. Yes. Um, and who owns that water and water rights and access, um, which are becoming a major, major issue because we know in any area where there's, um, where there is uh, violence, right? When there's, there's wars going on or violence, uh, the public health is immediately affected. Not just by the bullets, but by a lot of the secondary stuff, by refugee camps, displacement of people. Yeah. Um, and we know that water is gonna cause a lot of those issues and that with, if you don't have access to it, you can't have health. Right, and what about us? What's our carrying capacity in the state of Hawaii? How many people can actually live here or visit here? What's the, what's the wisdom right now? And, and have fresh water and a healthy environment. Yeah, you know, I don't think we really have good numbers on that. And that's something, you know, we're always seeing population growth. And, you know, it's going to be an island by island thing too, right? Is, you know, which islands can, can hold more capacity. And Big Island probably can have more capacity mm -hmm. when an island, um, you know, Oahu might be hitting the, the point where we're handling as many as we can. And so, you know, I think that's it's a good uh, area for future research. I don't have the numbers um, and I don't think the studies have been done. Yeah, I think it's going to be a relevant question because I know uh, when I go home at night, I hear, you know, I get an earful from my wife, you know, over and over again, what is it that we're doing if I'm on Oahu? And she tells me with all these new towers. But then when we're in our homes on uh, Big Island, it's much calmer. There's not that kind of growth and we don't have that same fight. So I'm wondering ultimately what, you know, what the impact of having a lot of building here will be. And it's interesting to me that, uh, that you bring up the consequence that water access may mm -hmm. have. Right. Um, but at the same time, where will they get their health care? You know, right. will there be right. a, a hospital that's available? Will there be enough um, pediatricians to do immunizations for children? Big public health questions right. also, right? Right. I mean, I think it's the population drives public health. I mean, that's, you know, you have to know stuff about population growth and, and demographics. And, you know, we see it's interesting all over the world. I mean, we've talked a lot about China, the one-child policy. Those things affect, in Japan, right. their big issue is aging. They, they have really low fertility rates, and they've got almost nobody below the age of 20. And so, you know, they're facing just the aging workforce and who's going to, you know, who's going to take care of all these elderly people. And right. so demographics drives so much of public health and, and um, it's kind of the background. And so we're looking not only at the growth that happens in Hawaii, but where does it come from? Who is moving to Hawaii? Is it retirees? Mm -hmm. Is it young families? And you no, know, it's more and more expensive that so many young families now are leaving Hawaii to go live in, you know, Vegas or California, you know, and, and go a place where they can buy a house. Right. right? And, and I think that that becomes farther and farther away from a lot of people with the you know, salaries that we have here. Amazing. Uh, but you're going to be providing good salaries because you're training all these young public health officials that are going to be able to work on this yes. program. What would you say to, um, to a young person out there that's considering a career in public health? What would your pitch be to them? I think it's, it's um, going to be one of the most growing fields that we're going to see um, in the country. Yes. I think it's, it's going to give you skills that you can use and it's going to give you something that's exciting. I get to work on all these different issues, which is, is just phenomenally interesting. Um, fun, fascinating all the time, you know, it's, you, you never know what's, what's the next thing we're going to work on right. and, and um, you get to do something that really makes a difference and I think that, that, you know, you always know when you go home at the end of the day, that, hey, I'm making a difference among the health of the people that, that live around me. Yeah, well, I have to say it's really, it's really been very interesting to watch your career um, from my perch at the legislature because when I see you uh, co-chairing the obesity task force or working on the stroke task force and then commenting on development and walkable and livable communities or on geothermal you're one of the very unique individuals that is touching on all of these many different areas uh, which I think historically many people would have been surprised if you said that it's um, 
an issue being taken up in the context of public health. And that's, I think, to people's credit, to ask you and your colleagues to weigh in, because without that expertise, I think we might have been flying blind for a very, very long time. Now, are you seeing that, that uh, countries like China or India or others are taking that same tact as we are in Hawaii to bring public health experts, or are they just doing it um, because you have a university affiliation? How's that going? Right. You know, that, um, it's, it's, it's starting to happen. Um, not as much in, in China. We're seeing it more in uh, Korea, which tends to do a lot of the stuff the U.S. does. Right. Um, but we're, we're getting there. We're actually working a lot with the faculty um, of these different universities. We have a consortium of Asia Pacific universities and a lot of them are traditional public health which means you you kind of are in one area, you don't do a lot of advocacy and the new public health is much more getting involved trying to change laws and policies and so we end up training a lot of the faculty there who then are influencing their local governments uh, much more than we can because they speak the language, they have the cultural connection, etc. Right, now okay so you're, you're preaching to your own choir and then they're going out at, and kind of it's got to become the gospel. Okay, yeah. well why don't we um, take a little break here? We're at the end of our third segment, and then when we return, we'll talk about your vision for public health in the future. Sure. All right. I'm Josh Green, your host at Health in Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm joined by Dr. Jay Maddock, who is the public health uh, lead over at Manoa. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host Josh Green from the Big Island. Today I'm joined by Jay Maddock, who's a PhD and lead over at Manoa for public health policy in our state. Jay's been instrumental in influencing public policy in areas of obesity, diabetes. He's now working with the development community on walkable districts. He's advising us on energy policy and what might or might not be the right scientific approach to things like geothermal energy. He's got his hands in many different areas that heretofore I might not even have been aware were public health questions. Jay's become an expert going over to China and working with faculty there, and they have many public health challenges. For instance, uh, very, very big challenges with clean air. They're growing at a very rapid rate, as we know, and going through their own industrial revolution. Things that will impact our environment, uh, envir uh, environment that has to do with the uh, global warming effect that he brought up in our second segment today. So, so many issues that really don't often occur to us in public health uh, discussions, but really are resonating today. We have only a few minutes left, and I wanted to turn it back over to our professor and say, what does the future hold for public health? What's going to be the big issues uh, in the coming years? And really, what would you appeal to the people of Hawaii? Sure. I think one of the big things um, is really to get people to think in a public health framework. Um, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, we now, we've now started this Bachelor in Public Health. But one of my goals is that we get undergraduate public health classes a lot like the way that psychology has become, you know, where you know half of undergraduates take a psychology class. I'd love half of the students to go through Manoa and through our community colleges um, to take a public health class because I think getting the framework and the way of thinking about the world is important no matter what career you go into. And I think it can really help us change our community if everybody had exposure to this field and at least thought about, you know, what am I doing? What's the effect on population health? How can we make a healthier community? And I think if we're able to do that, we're making a, a huge strike. I think that that sounds like a very smart move. So you're talking about whether people go into architecture or business or banking or into medicine, that if they have that grounding in the impact of public health on their discipline, lawyers, teachers, that they're going to be able to make 
that a, an integral part of how they operate within their disciplines. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that's exactly the way, is that you, know, you get that in the back of your framework, and when you start thinking like a public health person, you're thinking differently. You're thinking about populations. You're thinking about the effect on health. And if the, everybody could have that in the back of their head, no matter where they go, they can help make better decisions. I think it's a terrific approach. I'm so glad you joined us today, Jay, so thank you for being thank with you. us. And I'm saying, uh, as we say goodbye today to our viewers, I think we're gonna rely on Dr. Maddock as we uh, take up issues that range from smoking cessation, to diabetes, to soda attacks, uh, to the way we develop our communities and the way we educate our children. So I'm really pleased you're here as a leader in our healthcare community. I think we're gonna go far with this approach. Thank you for joining us with Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host from Big Island. See you next week.